This is Ask GMBN Tech, our weekly Q&A format show all about mountain biking tech. If you've got any questions, let us know in the comments below. Use the hashtag Ask GMBN Tech, or you can email us at the email address on the bottom of the screen right there. Okay, so first question this week comes from Eduardo de Paula. Ask GMBN Tech, is there something like too much braking? I'm just asking because I have an old Shimano set of Z brakes, that's the free ride brake that went alongside the Saints in case people don't know out there. And I'm building an XC bike and I don't really want to spend more money on it than I have to. Um, well, yeah, there actually is too much power sometimes. So you need to think about this. So your brakes are there to slow you down and you might think that having the most powerful brakes is the fastest way of slowing down. But if your brakes are too powerful, you're gonna lock your wheels up. So essentially there are a few things you need to factor in before just bolting on a set of powerful brakes like your Shimano Z's onto a bike, especially a lightweight bike like a cross country bike. Now the first up is the tires. Have they got enough traction on to support the amount of braking power that you're gonna be putting into that tire? Because if it's a semi-slick tire and you're gonna put a whacking great 200 mil rotor on it, for example, and you're gonna lock up that wheel, it's not gonna grip the, the terrain you're on, basically. Also, take into account the tire pressure it's at. So that has a huge effect straight away if your brakes are gonna be suitable for the bike and the type of riding you're doing. Next up, suspension. Make sure you have your sag set up correctly. Uh, if you haven't got enough sag set up on your bike, the suspension is quite firm, it won't be reactive, and there's more chance of your front wheel slipping or skidding out than there is actually gripping into the terrain when you reach for the brakes. Riding conditions, of course, if you're riding, let's just say, on gravel, and you grab a handful of brake, your wheel is going to slide out, fact. It's going to slide out before it grips, so it's not going to slow you down. So having extremely powerful brakes, if you're riding on a surface like gravel, might not be the best thing. So you can get around this, I'm going to tell you how in a minute, with a few little ideas. Um, then finally, your bike and your riding style. So let's just say, use two complete opposite ends of the spectrum, we use an XC bike. XC bike is typically, they're very lightweight, and they have minimal rolling resistance on the tires, and they don't have that much suspension. Now with a bike that doesn't weigh that much, if you have really powerful brakes on it, you're gonna lock the wheel up before you slow down extremely fast. Now if you go to the opposite end of the spectrum, downhill bikes are very heavy, they have tires with extremely soft rubber on, and the tires normally are run extremely soft as well as in tire pressure, and they'll be heavily lugged, so they have maximum traction. You'll also have up to 220 millimeters of travel, like suspension travel on there, so you've got all of that extra grip which means virtually you can have the most powerful brakes you can possibly have, like a set of Z brakes, with enormous disc rotors, which gives you more leverage. The bigger the rotor, the more power you can eke out of that brake. And you can use it all. You can use it on multiple different types of terrain, wet roots, rock. You'll be surprised on a downhill bike, the traction that's available to you. So essentially what I'm saying is you can bolt any brakes onto any bike, but there might be an overkill on that bike. Typically, those that ride XC bikes will have small disc rotors, even as small as 140 mil, and I have brakes that don't necessarily need the power that you would on a gravity-biased bike, like a downhill bike, and for good reason. Those brakes don't have to work as hard on a lightweight bike as they do on a bigger bike, so they can be smaller, they can be lighter, they can have less power. That said, you don't want to spend money on a new set of brakes for your bike, which is fine, so of course you can put those brakes onto a cross country bike. However, I would definitely recommend going for smaller disc rotors. I'd probably go for around 160 mil, but you can go as small as 140. Um, typically on most bikes, it's best to have a slightly bigger rotor on the front and a smaller one on the rear. The reason for that, especially on a cross country style bike, is you can load up the front wheel more, which means you can have more grip on that wheel and you can use it for more braking power. On the back wheel, if it's skidding, that means there's not enough weight on it. It doesn't mean it's just skidding because it's skidding. So if you're gonna have a bigger rotor on the back, you're just gonna skid quicker. So you've got a smaller rotor, you've got more chance of putting the correct amount of power down to slow you down effectively. Um, yeah, so go for it. Just do your research on some appropriate mounts and some smaller disc rotors to suit your brakes. Uh, suspension fork related question from Jacob R. Hi Donny, I've got a Marzocchi Dirt Jump 3 uh, from 2018 on my Canyon Stitched 360. That's a cool bike actually, I think Blake's got one of those. Um, I want to do a lower leg service on it, but I'm struggling to find good documentation on how to take it apart, what oils and greases, and in the quantity to use. 
Um, thanks for the videos, let's keep them up. Yeah, great, okay, so that fork is quite simple. I have two, I think, at least have three, one, two, three, uh, and even a fourth one. Um, as far as I know now, it's a Dirt Jump 1 and a Dirt Jump 3. Um, the Dirt Jump 1 has an oil bath in it, I don't think the 3 does. So, the principle for taking a fork apart is the same no matter what suspension fork. They have a slider, they have a stanchion, and they have a set of bolts to hold it all together. Now, the bottom of your fork, you will have either bolts or nuts on there. They need to be undone, and then you will shock those, and they will loosen the rods from the inside of those lower legs. Then that way you'll be able to slide off those lower legs. At the point that you undo those bolts or nuts, depending on what's on your exact fork, if there is any lower leg lube in there, you want to have something underneath, some metal cups, old plastic cups that you don't want to recycle, perhaps you want to keep for other purposes, a method basically of catching any oil that can come out. But the oil that may be inside yours that is purely there is to lubricate the bushes. It's not for any other reason. It doesn't need them in there as far as I know. A coil sprung fork and I've got a damping cartridge inside which can be replaced as an entire unit if that fails. Um, they're fairly simple, there's not too much to them. You can re-grease the inside of the wiper seals there, so get yourself a nice suspension friendly grease. There's many out there, there's the SRAM butter, there's slick oleum, there's slick honey, uh, there's all sorts of different brands. Just make sure you use this suspension specific one because they're safe on the rubber and it does help the action of the fork. If your particular ones have a foam ring on the underneath of that, take that out carefully. Use a fine pick or a, an old blunt screwdriver with a small head. Uh, clean that with some degreaser, wash it out and basically impregnate with fresh oil. Uh, the best way to do it really is to soak them in oil because you're assured they're going to take on as much as possible. But you could, if you don't want to be as messy, you could just basically put some oil on a syringe, put the foam rings back in place and apply the oil directly to the inside of the fork where that foam ring sits. Now, I'm just going to put up on screen an exploded diagram of your particular fork. As you see, it's fairly simple. I found some documentation on the Marzocchi website for the fork and it lists it as only needing grease on the inside, so therefore it doesn't need, as far as I know with your particular fork, it doesn't need any additional oil on the inside there. And adding additional oil can create other problems if it gets sucked up into the damper or if it ends up somewhere where it shouldn't, so I would generally follow that school of thought. Um, I'm also going to put a link to that image and also a link to the page on the Marzocchi holding page on their website in the description below this so you can click straight through to that and it will hopefully identify a few other things that you might need to know. Uh, good luck with that one. Oh, I just saw press fit bottom brackets in the title of this one. Get ready for another one. Okay, this one's from Zonascar. Coming back to press fit bottom brackets, why is it that headsets are press fitted and it's no problem, but with bottom brackets it is? Uh, okay, right. This is a bit, of a, a bit of a weak argument here, but if we look at the headset of a bike, the head tube of a bike generally is much thicker and it's much bigger than the bottom bracket shell. That's obviously a much smaller part and component of the bike. Now, the headset has a lot to do with overall frame integrity and how the front of the bike works. So typically the head tube of a bike will be quite thick. And then within that you have the press cups that are pushed in, which are generally very, very solid, very strong, and they require very specific tools to put them in. Now it's crucial that the fit is absolutely precise because if there's any movement this is basically going to damage the headset on there. Now you think how much leverage there is on the bottom of a fork that's moving a part of the frame like that and you think how much it has to do with the strain on the frame. It's a very different thing. Now the angles of the bearings they push into the headset itself and as the headset bearings are pre-loaded it's all held together tight and then as you ride the bike with your weight on it, it basically the whole lot is compressed. So it's a system that works very well given the size of the head tube on the bike and how much force goes through that. But if you look at the forces that go through a bottom bracket, it's very different. So you have completely rotational things going on there, whereas the headset you're only turning a little bit and you have a bit of twisting force. But that's going into a relatively small part of the bike. So when Cannondale first did the official, what, you, what I would call push fit or press fit, they had machined cups in the frame and the bearings would sit into those cups and then they would be preloaded, which is much more like how a headset works. Now this works fantastically. However, it costs a lot of money to manufacture a frame with tolerances, like basically time is money in frame manufacturing and to make a frame with tolerances that tight to get it the fit that good costs a lot of money basically. Um, so which is why PressFit exists because PressFit became a cheaper alternative to manufacturing a method of having the bearings pop straight in. So the way to do that was have a blank frame bottom bracket shell and you have 
these nylon or composite cups that basically would push in and they would house the bearings. Um, the problem comes if there's any, like even a minute amount of movement in there, um, that's amplified by that sort of twisting motion you're gonna get on there. And bit by bit, they walk around slowly. I mean, exaggerated movement of my fingers here, but the tiniest bit will translate as a creak. Uh, so therefore, it's just not the best system unless it's uh, basically set up perfectly to start with. Uh, there's too many little tiny things that can affect it. Whereas most headsets, fit and forget these days, um, it works well for a head tip, but it doesn't necessarily work best. I still think the classic screw-in cups work the best for a bottom bracket. Next one's from the strangely named um, Arslene, Asleen, Asleen. We'll go with Asleen. Sounds a bit better than Arslene, doesn't it? Um, I've got a plus size hardtail with Maxxis High Roller 2.8 tires on there on Hope Tech 35W wheels. Do you know or could you say whether those 35 millimeter rims could take a Maxxis Minion FBF and FBR, oh they're the huge ones aren't they, um, yeah 3.8s, which are at the smaller end of the fat bike, fat bike tire spectrum but an inch wider than what I have. No, I, I think they're too narrow to be honest. So a fat bike tire really is four inch and up to five inch and they're putting 70 to 80 mil, maybe even wider rims on those. I would say that at the narrowest, probably 60 to 75 mil would be the region. It would just be too much of a stretch and you'll end up with big tire wobble because there's not enough rim basically to support the carcass of that tire. Now you're gonna need some wider rims if you wanna go for tires that big, unfortunately. And there we go, another weekly Ask GMBN Tech in a bag. Don't forget to send your questions in for next week's show or add them in the comments below. Use that hashtag people, Ask GMBN Tech. Uh, for a couple more videos, click over here for classic mistakes when traveling with your bike. Uh, for another traveling related video, click down here for Neil and Blake's Patagonia adventure. Got to say, pretty envious of that one. An amazing video. Uh, thanks again, people. Don't forget to give us a huge thumbs up and subscribe. Cheers.